Hello and welcome to Lockdown Film School. Uh, this is our live filmmaker discussion series. Um, and we're back after over six months since our last session. Um, we're bringing the series back on a high note with our guest today, Agnieszka Holland. Uh, Agnieszka, thank you so much for joining us today. We're super excited to chat with you. Thank um, you. Thank you for having me. Cool. I mean, um, before we get on with the session, I would like to thank our sponsors, which who are Bird's Eye View. Um, they're a UK-based nonprofit that centers the female perspective in film and campaigns for gender equality in all film spaces and does so through screenings, events, and more. They do really, really great work. Uh, and you can find out more about them at www.birdseyebirds.com sorry, birds-i-view.co.uk. Um, and yeah, to, to very briefly introduce Agnieszka, uh, she is a Polish-born filmmaker who has worked around the world in film and TV. Um, her 1985 film Angry Harvest and 1990 film Europa Europa both brought her international acclaim, after which she directed several English language period pieces, such as The Secret Garden and Washington Square. And since then, she's directed episodes of a variety of TV shows, including The Wire and House of Cards. And her latest film, Charlatan, which we all really love here, was recently released in the UK, which is super exciting. Um, and I'm going to let Alex and Agnes just start that conversation now, but just note that there will be time at the end of the discussion reserved for audience questions. So you can write your questions down in the Q&A tab below throughout the live stream, just whenever they come to your head, write them down um, and we'll get to them at the end. At that point, we'll call on you to turn on your video and audio to ask your question directly. But if you'd rather I just read out the question for you, uh, just make sure that you let us know when you submit the question, the Q&A tab, that that's your preference. So with all that housekeeping out of the way, over to you, Alex. Okay, um, great. Well, um... So I'm just, uh, yeah, so I wanted to start with um, something that um, you had said when we talked back in January, which was that um, you share with the protagonist of Spoor a rebellious refusal to accept the world as it is. And I feel like that could describe a lot of the characters or the story of so many of your films. And I'm wondering if that's something that you think about when choosing projects. Um, and a project. Yeah. Hello, hello, everybody. Hi, Alex. Uh, no. You know, I I have to feel some kind of the urge to tell the story, and the story is coming to me in different ways. Sometimes it's the script. Quite often, actually, in the last years, it is the script which is sent to me by somebody, producers, or writers, writers, producers. Uh, sometimes it's a book I read, sometimes it's the true story I'm inspired by, sometimes it comes out from, you know, from my imagination or sensibility about what's going on uh, around me. So, uh, so the sources us are different, but um, every time I need to... Um, to make some 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 process of the appropriate uh, appropriation, it means I have to I have to really feel that is something which is part of myself and mm -hmm. which expresses something which is important to me, and is um, asking the questions I'm asking myself, and with the help of the story or this character or these um, images, um, I can express more that if I was just talking to you or writing some kind of the essays or statement or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so it needs to have the part of unknown and the part of the mystery, something which is secret, secret to me also. And in telling this story, I try to somehow find this 
the 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 clarity about um, about the secret about those questions knowing that maybe i will never found them but mm. um, it's exactly the process the journey and this journey is for me the most fascinating and i i i try to make it in the way that i can share it as a kind of the experience with the audience as well it mm. means for me it is important that what I'm telling and the way I'm, you know, shooting my films and um, storytelling um, uh, is accessible and attractive um, uh, to the as wide as possible um, audience. Of course, the kind of the stories I'm interested in and the language, which is pretty transparent, but it's not simplistic, uh, mm -hmm. can be not accessible for everybody. But I try to tell the story on several levels. And um, if it's not accessible for everybody in the same way, I think you still can find, even if you are not so much involved in the, in the world I'm, you know, I'm, I'm talking about, uh, to find some um, emotional connection, which is mm -hmm. like probably the most important. I don't know if I did answer your question. Maybe it is too general, mm. but because the stories I'm telling actually are very, very, very different mm -hmm. and from different times and with uh, different characters and um, with different scale and scope, uh, I think that I can answer only in, 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 in this general way. It has, I have to feel the urge to, to tell it. Hmm. And when you talk about like telling stories on different levels, what do you mean by that? Oh, I mean that um, take charlatan, for example. Hmm. Uh, you can go on the on the like the simplest narrative about the man who has a great gift and um, goes through the life fighting the obstacles. Or you can also um, ask the question about the power of the nature and the importance of the nature as a source of the power. And also about the manipulation um, the different regimes of 20th centuries and have been uh, doing to the citizens um, of Europe, especially Central Europe. And the level of the conformism, which is necessary in order to survive and to have the life which, uh, which, um, which, which can be satisfying for you. And um, another, you know, part of the story, the story of the forbidden love, and uh, the man who choosing uh, to, to depend on the nature cannot accept his own nature, his own identity. And, um, you know, so it's several like levels and you can, you can go, you can enter the story on different level and still um, have some kind of the fullness of the reception. I mean, you've made quite a few films that are about that sort of, about um, totalitarian regimes and life under totalitarian regimes. And I guess I'm wondering both what interests you in that in general, and also like in, you know, say in Charlatan and Mr. Jones, your more recent films too. Uh, you know, I, I, I spent big part of my life in the authoritarian regime. It wasn't completely totalitarian in the times when I was grown up. Uh, but when I was a child, you know, in the in in the communist Poland um, under Stalin's rules, it was totalitarian, and the people who who've been the enemies for the you know for the um, um, ideology and the power which was there have been um, destroyed, at least uh, arrested and often killed. Uh, so, um, but uh, always the f basic freedom. Um, was taken uh, from the citizens and they have to accept and to, to conform uh, to the rules of the regime, which have been less or more strict depending on the period. But uh, always was um, 
intruding very deeply into your personal and citizen rights. So it is my experience, and that is the experience of the big, big uh, part of the world population, especially in 20th century. But um, uh, now those this kind of the regimes is coming back under different, different form. All those populist regimes, uh, which are much more cynical and less ideological than it was. Um, that it was in 20th century and based mostly on the uh, alternative realities and the lies and fake news and 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 um, and polarization and um, the, the division of the society uh, they are they are they are present in several countries and not only in the underdeveloped countries but in the countries like for example united states of america um, where we see that um, uh, for the reason of you know of 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 the power, uh, the rulers of the country uh, have been able to divide the society on two incompatible um, uh, fields. Uh, so um, it is some some kind you know the the lie and the fake news and the propaganda uh, are the part of the of the of the authoritarian or totalitarian regimes. And also some kind of the um, refusal of accepting the you know the judiciary, the the the, the check and balance, and um, and the right of the minorities to to have the voice, and um, and the rights um, for women, for example, to decide the, about their own life and um, and about their procreation. All those things are making. Um, making you know the real freedom pretty rare and um, i read recently that um, about 90 percent of the of, of the population um, on the earth today is not living in full democracy that the full democracy is very rare spe species uh, that is the one thing which you will tell it's coming from the outside. The people who are voting for this kind of the regimes, you believe mostly they uh, they are fooled for some promises or for some waves of fears. But in reality, maybe they like those regimes. Maybe something which um, which Eric Fromm, the the, the famous um, um, uh, psychoanalyst um, from um, 20th century called the escape of freedom. It means that the people are afraid of freedom and tired of the freedom and they, that they easily delegate the responsibility and decisions of somebody who, who is a leader, who is, you know, who is, um, who is um, the power, who is up. So, you know, those are the questions which, which, um, which um, somehow decides about our lives. And, um, and uh, that is speaking only about the, the power, but we have also the power of money. We have the, 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 the manipulation of the, you know, big corporations and the capitalistic rules um, and a lot of fake news then, for example, like um, crisis which started in US um, in 2008 uh, with, the, with, the, with the real estate bubble and which after went through the entire world and and changed the world somehow before another big wave came pandemic this time uh, proved that um, the governments and elected governments uh, don't have the real uh, power of decision that they are less powerful than the big corporations and so on and so on so, you know, those are the questions which decides about the, our life and also about our future, especially your future, girls, because I am fortunately for myself, I'm old enough maybe not to live till the biggest uh, climatic uh, climate uh, disaster will, will happen. But um, we are certainly responsible for the fact that uh, your future is so uncertain and so gloom. You know, I'm wondering a bit about how you think about depicting 
I mean, this is sort of broad, so we could just talk about charlatans, say, but like how you think about the the aesthetic for showing, like, you know, creating that world and giving the audience a sense of what what it's like to live in in such a state. That is, you know, very intimate process and it's every time slightly different. So it's difficult to say, you know, of course, I'm I'm thinking about it. I'm discussing with my closest collaborators, like the cinematographer and production designer, and um, and you know, and um, watching a lot of photographs and, uh, and other imaginary movies, documents, uh, and take the inspiration from very different things. But in reality, it is a bit what. Um, what uh, Michelangelo um, um, was telling about sculpting, that when he had the uh, piece of marmor, uh, marmor, uh, he said that the sculptor is already in, that he needs just to take out, you know, the unnecessary stone uh, to find the, the 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 real form of of uh, what he's uh, what he's um, uh, creating. Uh, it's not completely like that with the movie making, which is, you know, not so physical and not so individual, not so lonely mm, expression of yourself. Uh, but um, the story asks for some, you know, the, the mix of the story of my sensibility and, you know, the input coming from the actors, from the, from the, collaborators uh, from the uh, sets, from the light, all of this somehow pushes you, at least me, into some, you know, decisions, which um, by the end are responsible for the final aesthetic. I am not conceptual person. It means I, um, I like the process. I don't like to know exactly how to do it. And after I just do it, you know, like, uh, um, uh, taking page by page, you know, of the script like that, uh, precisely as I as I planned. No, I have some general plans, which sometimes on the second or third day of the shooting um, appear to be to be wrong. And uh, it happened to me several times that I had some concept with Charlatan, for example. I wanted this contemporary part. It means the storyline, which is you know. When when Mikolaszek is uh, oldest and um, and before he's arrested and after you know after in in prison and so I wanted to make it quite dynamic. I I was afraid of certain stiffness and theatricality of that. Uh, and we tried to move the camera in pretty elaborate way, but it didn't work. It means I had the impression that the camera, like the horse, was you know refusing to move uh, to move forward. And so we, we've been pushing this camera, but she didn't want to be pushed. And then we realized that it's the opposite, that this part really needs some kind of the distance, some kind of the stiffness, because it's how his soul is like, how the reality he is living through um, is, is like, that it expresses the best, this part of the story. So, uh, so we try to find, I try to find, and we try to find, because as I say, it's collective uh, work, uh, some inner truth and some aesthetic truth of the story we are, we are, we are, we are telling. Um, I mean, I'm wondering a bit about your interest in period pieces. I feel like you've made a lot of really wonderful, detail-rich, um, period pieces, and I'm wondering what it is about them that attracts you, and what storytelling opportunities you feel that they afford. But, but I think it's many reasons. Um, uh, first, when I'm telling something which happened, and we have some kind of the distance, it is easier probably to see the exactly the totality of the of the meanings um uh, of this story when we are living something through and especially in our times which are so over you know active with so many things which are going on and to capture the essence of that is it's quite difficult that is probably one reason but another reason is more philosophical it means for me the past is not the past 
And um, I read some line in some novel of William um, Faulkner, who said that um, uh, maybe the past even don't exist, doesn't exist. Uh, and, um, and I believe that the past is present. It means um, all those layers of the past I am, I am exploring sometimes are somehow present uh, in, in our lives and underneath of our reality. So, uh, of course, I'm looking for the period or for the characters which uh, I can connect with the contemporary sensibility and which are relevant and, and, and somehow timeless. Like, uh, for example, I did Mr. Jones, my previous film before Charlatan, uh, because I felt that the story is extremely relevant um, for the contemporary world, especially the place, the journalism, and the responsibility of the journalist and the truth and the fact checking uh, uh, in our times is pretty relevant with the story I was telling. And also the cowardice of the governments and, you know, and the indifference of the societies, of the people, of the audience is pretty relevant, unfortunately, as well. I mean, is there a difference for you between films that you write yourself versus ones that where you're, you know, using a script by somebody else? Because you you have written a few of your films, but I guess a lot more recently have been films, well, aside from Spore, um, that are scripts by other people. Yeah, it, it is slightly different, you know, especially on the beginning, and I feel some kind of the responsibility and the faithfulness to the vision of the writer. But all those scripts, I've been reworking with the writers after accepting it. Uh -huh. And in some point, I started to feel it like if it's my own, you know. The director, it is a very strange profession because it's quite difficult to capture what the director really does. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and he has or she has uh, the uh, mentality of the thief. You are stealing, you know, you are stealing from, from, from everybody the best ideas and the best, you know, uh, the best solutions and, the, and their work. And you put it together and you believe that it's your own. Uh, and you are selling is, uh, it as something you did. Uh, the, the film is directed by, you know, but in reality, of course, it is the works, uh, work of many. And very few films are, are fully the, uh, the films of um, auteur, uh, as French say. You have to write it, you have to shoot it, you have to, 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 to make the camera, you have to edit it and uh, even to compose it, the music mm. if you use any music, and sometimes even to, to play the main part. You have some films like that, and some of them probably are good. Uh, but certainly it is not my case. I prefer um, to hide behind, you know, behind, behind like the screen. I, 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 I don't want to, uh, to show too much. Oh, it's mine. Mm -hmm. In the same time, as I said, is um, I'm not doing anything except maybe some television work when sometimes I'm doing it for fun or for for, for having the experience, some technical experience or some storytelling experience. But when I'm doing future film, it is because I, I fully feel that I have to do it. Hmm. I mean, what is the process like for working with the writer to, to, to uh, on the script, like for a charlatan? He, he's been very open, you know, it's a pretty young um, writer, um, Marek Epstein is his name. And he was, um, when writing the script, he was collaborating also with the, with some um, executive from Czech television, uh, who is um, a, dramat a dramaturg. And uh, they together have been making very like good team to, to, to look for always better and better solution. And when I um, got involved, um, I shook a bit, you know, the, the story. And after we started to reconstruct it in the pretty similar way, finally, it was written in the script, but then um, changing the balance and change, adding some stuff and taking off some stuff. 
and and changing the balance. Um, uh, it, it it was it was quite long process actually, uh, because I when I agreed to make the script, I I had another uh, work um, which I already committed to, and I asked them if they will be waiting for me like three four years. It was Spore and Mr. Jones, which was already you know which I committed already was in in progress somehow. Mm -hmm. So they waited for me, and in the meantime, sometimes we met and um, made another version of the script. And in the meantime, he was like thinking about it, and we did some uh, casting, you know, to figure out what the actors are bringing to the story. So it was, uh, it was so long that <laughs> when I came uh, to Prague to start the actual pre-production. Just, just like the same moment I finished Mr. Jones, it wasn't even, it overlapped a bit. Um, I suddenly wasn't sure why I wanted to do, to make it, you know, it was, I had the, about a week of panic that I forgot what was the deep reason I wanted to make the, this, this movie. And, but fortunately after, you know, um, I, I, I found, I found the track again. And what was that? Sorry? And what was that? What the track? Mm. Well, you know, it's, I, I don't like too much to, to like make the explication for the film, especially mm. the film I did, because I think it, it speaks by itself or it's unnecessary to do it. Uh, so, um, so I am open to different interpretations. And for me, it was some, some, as I said, some essential questions about human condition, which um, life and death and, you know, and, and, and the cowardice and the courage and love, uh, essence of love and, you know, betrayal and fear of death, you know, many things like that. And the healing, the special gift you have and what is the price you are paying for, for this special gift? And it concerns the people like Mikolaszek, but it concerns also uh, the genius um, artists, which I also made the movies um, about, uh, like about French poet in Total Eclipse, um, um, Rimbaud and Verlaine, or um, Ludwig van Beethoven in, in, in Copping Beethoven. So those questions somehow are, you know, uh, coming back in my films, the questions of the identity and the, and the special gift and the price you are paying if you want to be special or, or have to be special and the freedom and the lack of freedom and the manipulation and the conformism and all, all those all the, and all those things you know which which are present in my in several of my movies. You've worked in so many different languages all around the world, and I'm wondering what the difference is for you between when you're working in like English or French or German or Czech. And I know with Europa Europa, you actually had actors speaking in multiple languages on set too. Mm -hmm. Well, Europa Europa, you know, um, I did two movies in German, uh, which was Europa Europa and um, um, Angry Harvest, and I don't speak German actually. It means in this uh, time I understood pretty well, but I didn't speak. Uh, but I wrote the scripts myself. Those two scripts have been written by me. <laughs> and um, and when you write the script, you feel very strongly the like inner partition, emotional partition of the story. So even if somebody is changing a bit the dialogues, I feel it, even if I don't understand what they are telling exactly. Uh, but of course, it's much better to work in the language you know. Uh, it's much easier, uh, and the easiest way, easiest thing is to um, work in your native language because this language you feel the best. I like work also in Czech. I study in Czechoslovakia um, in the film school uh, in late sixties, early seventies, and that it was I was very young there, and it was the time of my formate formation it was very important period for me and um, self discover and the discovery of the of the world and the politics and the art and everything 
So, uh, so I love I love actually working there. Recently, I did the uh, after it means I never worked there after finishing uh, the film school, especially the Czechoslovakia was for twenty years in some kind of the very authoritarian mood, uh, and the cinema was practically dead, at least mm. free cinema. Uh, but um, in some point. Um, uh, I got the project of the miniseries, which um, European HBO picked up, and I did it. And it's one of my favorite work. It's called Burning Bush, and it's about um, exactly the period when I was studying in Czechoslovakia. Very important politically for for this country and uh, and for I think for Europe altogether. And after Charlatan came, so it was very happy shooting. Uh, and I love working with the Czech crew. Uh, they are quite special. They are very professional, but in the same time, free. It's like the mix of the of the best from Poles and from Americans, and they have it all in one. And uh, English is natural language for the cinema. It means um, even if my English is um, Far to be perfect, I, I I can feel the you know the, the the truth of that. I hope, and French is okay. So you know, yes, of course it 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 makes it is less about the dialogues my movies uh, than mm -hmm. when you are doing um, when you are doing the films uh, rooted very much in the one particular reality. Mm -hmm. You've worked, I mean, but you've worked both in feature films, but also as a director for Higher on Television. And I guess I'm wondering, what do you like about working in television as compared to film? And, you know, have you learned anything from working in TV that you brought to film or vice versa? Well, some speed I like. I, I like the fact that it's, you know, that very quickly you can like, you can... Uh, experience some world but when i when i decided to do some um, american uh, tv series uh, it was because uh, i understood i felt that the interesting cinema is in crisis and um, and that something which i call a cinema of the middle it means the cinema which is complex but in the same time accessible and attractive which has innovative and in the same time has personal point of view that this cinema is in big crisis, it disappeared somehow. And it moved to, to the television and the innovative, you know, new TV series um, did have this kind of the, you know, of the, of, the, of, the, of the fever of the discovery and the invention and innovation. So I wanted to try. Uh, and I was lucky that, you know, one of the first work um, I was invited to was The Wire. And that it was great journey for me, um, not even so much technically, um, but to to explore and to enter so deeply uh, the world of the you know of the of the American city of the tragedy of American city, uh, the scene and described by David Simon, who is such a you know um, non-compromising observer and, and, and great writer and the great reporter also. Uh, it was for me like really, really, really very interesting journey. And after he invited me to format Treme, which was about New Orleans after Katrina, which was another, you know, tragedy of another very American city. And suddenly me being Polish, you know, woman, I had the access to this very American stories and you know, and I had to make a lot of like mental work to 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 understand it and to really uh, go deeply into that, and that gave me some some knowledge of America and of the world, of this world um, and society, uh, which was priceless. So I am very grateful for for this experience. And then other things like you know, House of Cards, or the killing, or. Um, 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 what I did, but anyway, it was interesting and you know, visually, uh, visually or storytelling, like um, 
instructive, but um, but not like essential. Uh, and I did also uh, some series in Poland, which we which I did with my daughter and with my sister. The one series, some kind of the you know West Wing, um, um, uh, a la polonaise. Uh, and that it was really interesting to you know to 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 come with the original idea and develop it uh, together with with the other co-directors and the writers and uh, and to you know to create the the world out of the scratch and I like this format and my favorite format actually is miniseries miniseries which gives you more space to develop the characters and the story than the future film. But in the same time, which is not like going over and over, because the 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 um, uh, not, uh, multi episodes um, uh, or multi seasons um, TV series has always some kind of the conventional um, storytelling. You always need some hook by the end of the episode, and you know, and uh, and after a while, when you are doing it, it 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 becomes a bit mechanical. I, I don't feel such an urge now to, to do the TV series, except if something really exceptional will come on my plate. Um, so when we talked back in, um, in January, you'd mentioned that two of your most important collaborators are editors and camera operators. Um, and so I guess I'm wondering what, what is it that you look for in an editor and a camera operator? Well, they are like, you know, they are like my eyes and my hands or something, you know, it means um, uh, uh, it, it is when it, when it really happens, you know, how the film is told and how it's seen. The, the camera operator is giving the, the final framing and the final rhythm of the of the camera movements and somehow you know it's uh, about his sensibility or talent if he discovers something important in 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 the frame which i even haven't seen or which just happened in front of the camera and he reacted to that and that is something it's like you know it's like jazz player it means uh, the, the for me the good camera operator it is like the great jazz player uh, capable to improvise in the way which is even better than what was practiced before, what was rehearsed before. And the editor, uh, the, the good editor, the great editor, not only feels my rhythm and how I wanted to tell the story, but, but he adds another possibilities and another layers, you know, of the of the discovery of what was hidden in the material, which also sometimes I haven't seen myself. So, so they are the collaborators which has to be in sync with me because they are like my, my tools somehow. Uh, but in the same time, if they are great, they can uh, elevate, you know, my ideas much higher. When do you start working with them? Like, do you um, do you do certain kinds of prep with the editor and the camera operator to make sure that you're on the same page? Or is it just that you've been working together for so long now? Uh, ideally is to work with the people you know already and, and you and you feel so good with, you know, which is not always possible with me when I'm, I'm working in multiple countries. Uh, but, you know, on my last movies, for example, I, I, I mostly ask the, the camera, Polish uh, camera operator who I discover when doing this TV series in Poland, uh, uh, it was like probably 15 years ago or something like that. And since we've been collaborating on several things, also when I when I when I shot in Paris or in Czech Republic, uh, and he became now also the lighting um, uh, cameraman. So sometimes he, in the spore, for example, he did one one part of the. Uh, of the movie, well, one season he did, mm. and because it was shot on four seasons, so um, we had several uh, several cinematographers on this one. Uh, and the editor, I have uh, one or two editors in Poland I like to work with. I have um, 
one great editor in Prague who did also Spur and who I like to work with. And, um, and actually in America, I had great experiences, but also very bad experiences. It, I had the experiences when I had to uh, fire the editor because we cannot, we've been unable to find the, you know, the, the, the common ground. So it is sometimes feel lucky, you know, of course I'm watching another movies um, when I'm starting the casting for the new collaborators because I cannot use my regulars. Uh, I'm, I'm watching the films or um, they did before, but it's not always, you know, it, it, it not always completely tell you if it will work or not. Because you never know what is the part of the editor, what is the part of the you know director, um, and if uh, being uh, talented, he will be compatible with with my way of working. So that is always very tense de decision, and sometimes not so good for decision you have to 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 make when you cannot bring somebody you worked with before. I mean, I know that on some of your films like Europa, Europa and Mr. Jones, you ended up like the film was was done and then you ended up going back in and deciding to to chop off um, a chunk of the runtime. And I'm wondering, like, how do you know when that's something that you need to do? And then, like, what is the process for figuring out what to cut out? Well, you know, when we are, I think that in general, it will be good to have this possibility that, you know, that you are shooting the film and during the shoot, you stop, you cut the things together and you still have like 30% to shoot and you realize that maybe you went in the wrong direction and you can rethink it a bit, that you have this possibility. For example, my friend Pavel Pavlikowski is working in this way. Uh, and but you need the special kind of the producers who allow you to work in this way because of course it, it means that is that the shooting time is you know longer and and um, and you have to keep some sets or actors or whatever under the you know, contract so it is difficult to 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 have this luxury and it will be good you know after to have the break before you start to editing and after you edit, after because you know the editing process is that that you 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 go um, you go stage by stage, stage by stage, version after version, and in some point you feel that it's done. That is the ideal version, but sometimes it is not. You just lack the distance or another eye, and sometimes you have the producers or distributors who intervene, not always in the best way. And you start to defend your vision. So you are not so open anymore. And you are tired because you live with this film a few years. Uh, so it will be, and you, in America, you have this, uh, this um, uh, test screenings, which are the nightmare for the directors. But in the same time, I think they are quite useful because they are so tense and so stressful. You have to like, open up all your, you know, senses to feel what is coming back from the audience. And I'm not talking about the analyzes or the cards or notes, but about this, you know, feeling you have during the screening. Uh, and, um, and it happened to me without test screenings because in Europe you, you practically don't have this, this, uh, this uh, tool. Uh, when screening the film um, first time for the big audience. And I felt suddenly that it's not here yet, that it could be more efficient or more, that, that it has still some fat, you know, I have to take off. Uh, and in this moment, I start to, you know, to, to, to have the new inspiration how to do it. And, and mostly it means in those two cases, certainly it was for the good. And if you have, you know, um, uh, collaborative producers and who understand the process, and they agree uh, to go back to the editing room and um, and you know they accept some some costs, which actually happen to to pay off because in both cases um, we sold the films pretty well. Uh, 
uh, or very well even uh, and without this kind of the of the of the trimming probably it will be not so successful So it's the question of the trust, you know, that uh, the producer um, and financier that they are trusting the the director that I know what I'm doing when I'm proposing this kind of the of the changes. Mm -hmm. I mean, you talk a bit about making sort of like um, kind of like middle cinema that sort of got a lot of you know intelligent ideas, but that is also kind of accessible, and that makes me really think about. Um, the Secret Garden, which is which I first fell in love with as as a child when I saw it in in the cinema, um, but is like a film that I still love now as an adult, like almost thirty years later. And I'm wondering, like, how do you think? How did you think? Like, it's such a. I feel like even now it's still such a rare idea to have a, a children's film that is just as accessible to adults. It's just as complex and thoughtful. And I guess I'm wondering, like, how did you think about? you know, catering to those different audiences within that film? Well, you know, it was based on the classic books, which was my one of my favorite when I was a child. And I asked myself the question, what is so universal in this book and how it's possible that, you know, generations later, it still has the power. And, you know, so I, I try to... To, to, to understand what I really loved in that and what I really love and what I will would like to give as a gift to the children audience, but also to the audience of my contemporaries. And, um, uh, and I found that this story has very strong uh, emotional symbolism uh, and um, which rarely exists in the children, you know, world because it's mostly going after the plot, you know, it has to be adventurous. And here the, the most of adventurous are pretty inside of the, of the characters. And, you know, I try to just treat the children like the sensitive uh, grown up, you know, curious people uh, who has the empathy for, you know, very strange uh, emotions and strange character, and at the same time to give the key to the to the love for nature, which is one of the main subject of of of, of the story. So uh, to make it sensual, you know, it means to 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 make it not as a as a kind of the preaching, you know, preaching story, but as an experience. So I did very much what I am doing with the films for you know grown up and. I, I working with the with the young actors, they've been nine mostly, uh, most of them, uh, Colin and uh, and Mary and uh, and Dickon, they've been around between nine and ten. Uh, and they've been so sensitive, those kids, and so open to understand and to make this emotional journey that I thought, you know, if they are ready, the audience will be ready, I hope. Um, Alex, don't we have to open uh, up the floor because it's already yes. 50 minutes left? <laughs> yes. So I'm going to turn it over to Orla, who's going to um, uh, field the questions now. So, yes. Um, so I'm going to write some of the, the read out some of the written submitted questions. But just if you're watching, know that like at any point you can still submit a question or you can press the raise hand function and we'll invite you on the call. Um, so yeah, um, I think this question feels very uh, fitting, speaking of the unusual protagonist of The Secret Garden. Um, someone's asked about, could you talk about what drew you to the film Washington Square, uh, which is also a film I really like, um, and the protagonist feels quite unusual and ahead of its time, um, watching it back now. Um, you know, um, I, I, I wasn't aware when I, I read the script, script adaptation of Washington Square and I knew the novel, um, Henry James novel, um, uh, but I wasn't familiar with the very famous and very beloved um, version by William Wyler. Um, mm -hmm the play, the Harris, which was made, which was based on, on, uh, on Washington Square. So maybe if I knew how, 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 
popularities. <clears throat> I will not have the courage to do my ver my version, and my <laughs> version is very different, you know, because um, uh, I believe that is much closer to the James uh, philosophy, which uh, certainly is not the revenge story. Mm. Uh, what was the wireless story, and I think also why it was so popular, is very American concept of the revenge story. That if something, if somebody makes you something bad, you will you will take revenge on that. You will let him pay back. Um, mm -hmm. And here it was like, uh, to me, the story of very, you know, very painful, very slow, because the person, the main character is quite slow. She's not the most brilliant or most open or more courageous human being. But, you know, this awakening to the, to being myself, to the self-acceptance or self-knowledge or... And this awakening is very, you know, delicate. And um, when um, I decided to do it, I, I told to myself that I will give to that some supplementary feminist touch, mm. which somehow was present in, in Henry James' novel, but certainly not so in such a conscious way, you know. So yeah. it, it was, you know, it was about that, about... Um, spending the time and putting a lot of attention of somebody who is exactly maybe not ugly but not beautiful maybe not stupid but not very bright mm -hmm. maybe and so on and to see how how slowly it you know this this like wild flower is is opening and that everything somehow that she is able by the end to you know to to take the control, to control her life, which is very difficult for women in those times and very difficult for women today, mostly, very often, too often. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, this question asks, uh, how did you think about um, creating the sets for Charlatan, especially Jan's mansion? About what? The, the mansion in Charlatan and creating that set. Oh, set of the villa where he is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the real one, because that is, you know, based on the true character and the true story. So we visited the real one and it was much less spectacular from the mm -hmm. architecture point of view. But because it is like somehow, you know, this, this set has to express his, you know, taste and his ambitions and his, you know, scope which is so unbearable for the communist authorities because it's a, it is some kind of the luxury and you've been not allowed to be to have the, your private possession you know in this time so he was like ir really irritating for everybody that he was so you know so different and this house had to express it somehow uh, mm -hmm. so we've been looking for some you know real sets because it, it is real set and we've been lucky to find this villa which was just kind of abandoned, mm. given for sale. So we had all the freedom, you know, to arrange it in our way. Um, that is always fascinating, you know, to look for the locations and and to look for the actors when you are preparing the film. It's where a lot of decisions which are crucial for how the film looks and feels after uh, are made. Yeah, yeah. Um, Helen asks, uh, what do you think of the new generation of female filmmakers? Does it surprise you or maybe give you hope? Well, I'm, I feel very, you know, happy that some opening happened. And um, it was very long, very long. It was like practically this glass ceiling was very low. Mm. And um, we are actually, I'm, you know, um, the president of European Film Academy now. And before mm. I was a chairman of this academy and and also being the the member of the American Film Academy we we tried like to break it to you know to 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 make the parity and at least you know to open up the um, the the cinema to the you know voiceless part of the humanity uh, because very, for a very long time you know it was um, uh, the percentage of the of the women making films and television in the US was about seven eight percent, mm. 
Mm. And in Europe, it was a little more. It was like 18 to 20. But still, if you consider that 50% of the humanity, maybe even more, are women, it meant that, you know, that most of them, it's speechless, you know, it's, it doesn't have the possibility to express themselves and to share their experience and their sensibility through such an important medium like is, you know, audiovisual narration. Mm. Uh, and it was, it was, it, it came from the, you know, it came from the, some kind of the gender, you know, gender, uh, gender um, traditions and, you know, the financiers didn't trust women that they can make lo lo high budget movies and, um, and the producers rather have been working with another boys and, um, and the, the festival selectors was telling there's not enough of good women's film to, you know, select them. And the critics um, have been always more harsh with the uh, film made by a woman than film made by men. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, it, it, it is a lot of things to change. And the um, audience started to change first. And a few years ago, uh, suddenly, you know, first time um, in American um, Hollywood history, the films were with the f female lead made more money than the films with the male leads. Mm -hmm. It meant that the audience wanted suddenly to see different stories. And it opened up, I think, the way to the... To the, the women storytellers as well, and this year was like revolutionary because you know not only the, the woman won an Oscar, uh, but also it was two women uh, among five nominated for the best director, and it was two women nominated uh, in the international categories for the, out of the five. So suddenly, and it could be even, but I think that it was more great women's films which could be prized and and you know and the the woman won the oscar for the best screenplay and so on and so on so still it is a boys club but i think that it will be not the it will be not so for 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 long mm. and i you know I, I i try always to support my mm, my um, colleagues, um, uh, female uh, directors and producers and um, screenwriters and, and you know, to give, to share my experience and to support them as much as I could. Yeah, yeah. Um, Valerie asks, early in your career, how did you negotiate with co-productions, i.e. with producers from different countries, sales agents, et cetera, how did you fight for your vision when they challenged you? Mm, you know, now it's much easier because I, I have such a big body of work and the people know who I am. If they decide to collaborate with me, they know less or more what are my rules and what are my limitations and what are, what is, what are my strengths. Uh, but if not, you always have to fight for your vision. It's not easy, you know, when... When, especially when you are dealing with the big corporations, where where it's rarely like personal decision, it's mostly some body which is behind the decisions and notes and and so, and marketing decisions. So you don't have the not only full control but even majority of the control. Uh, it's why also I decided to do in like last ten years mostly. Um, European uh, independent movies where my control is um, as high as possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, we have to wrap up now, but I just wanted to ask quickly at the end, uh, can you tell us anything about what you're working on next? Well, you know, it was strange year for me mm. as for everybody. Uh, COVID like stopped me somehow. Um, I supposed to do the new Apple TV series shot in Paris, and it mm. was cancelled because of the of the very bad, you know, ep epidemiological conditions in France. Mm. Uh, so I had I had practically the year off um, professionally, and I, and in the same time, so many many interesting things have been happening in the world, politically and socially, and 
uh, that I was like connected to the news, trying to figure out where we are, you know, yeah. and uh, I'm thinking how to translate it to my next film, which, uh, which I, I have some notes and some sketches, but I'm not sure yet if I will be able to translate it. Uh, it means not the COVID story, but, but like the, 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 some premonition about where we are going, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't have anything ready. I had some scripts which been sent to me, which mm, two or three of them even are really interesting. So maybe it's something you know to develop and uh, and but it will not happen before next year, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, well, great. Th thank you so much again for from all of us for for taking the time to do this. I think we've all really appreciated it and loved hearing from you thank you thank yeah. you Ola. thank you alex thank you everybody who i don't see <laughs> and, also, and i hope that we'll we'll all come back to these theaters to watch the movies in the right place yes thank you so much again real thank pleasure you. yeah Bye. um yeah, we'll let you go. Uh, but everyone watching, we have a few announcements at the end if you want to hear them. Um, bye, bye. 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 Um, yeah, so uh, I wanted to thank again our sponsor, Bird's Eye View. Um, and yeah, just quickly, we've got a brief exclusive announcement. Um, this hasn't been officially announced yet uh, until tomorrow it will be or we'll send you an email about it then when it is but we've got more lockdown film school events coming soon um, so our next ebook uh, which again is being announced tomorrow is called subjective realities the art of creative nonfiction. Um, it's all about creative nonfiction, sort of creative approaches to documentary. Um, and I mean, we're super excited about it. I'm super excited about this topic. Uh, and it will be accompanied by a ticketed lockdown film school mini series on creative nonfiction with four sessions over July and August. So we've yet to announce the full lineup of guests, but to give you a sneak peek, two of the nine speakers will be Robert Green and Kirsten Johnson. Uh, Robert Greene made films like Bisbee 17, Kate Plays, Christine, Actress, and Robert um, Kirsten Johnson made Camera Person and Dick Johnson is Dead. Uh, huge fans of both of them. And we're super excited to reveal more details tomorrow and in the coming weeks that you've had this ex exclusive scoop. Um, and stay tuned. Uh, thank you all for watching. Um, thanks again to Agnieszka. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your days or nights. Thanks for joining us.